Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Good morning, dear students. Welcome to my class. This is lecture number 10. In this lecture, we will be studying about Warren Hastings, his reforms and his relations with uh, the rulers of the country will be taken into account. Starting with the appointment of Warren Hastings as the governor in 1772. He became the governor of Bengal in 1772. It created a new chapter as far as the history of English East India Company was concerned. He had to face Herculean task once he was appointed as the governor of Bengal. He was to introduce an efficient administrative system in Bengal improve the finances of the company as well as to develop trade and commerce. These were the challenging tasks before Warren Hastings. Starting with the administrative reforms introduced by Warren Hastings once he became the governor of Bengal. As you may recall now the dual system of government introduced in Bengal by Robert Clive in 1765. Under this system, there were two masters in Bengal. One was the English East India Company and other was the Nawab. This system came in known as dual system of government. The dual system of government was a transcendent failure. So, he introduced Warren Hastings once became the governor of Bengal. He ended the dual system of government which had been introduced by Robert Clive. The president and the council began to act as the divan and they engaged in the collection of revenue from Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. The two deputy divans, they were appointed by Robert Clive in 1765. Muhammad Rasa Khan, he was in charge of Bengal for the collection of land revenue and another deputy divan was Raja Shidab Roy. He was in charge of the collection of land revenue in Bihar. Both of these two deputy divans were dismissed by Warren Hastings. Appointment of collectors. It was Warren Hastings who made the appointment of collectors for the management of the affairs of the revenue collection in Bengal. The council and the governor or the president formed the board of revenue which managed the affairs of the revenue collection across Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. Once these deputy divans were removed from their offices, Warren Hastings appointed collectors who were required to manage the affairs of the land revenue in Bengal, Bihar and Oriza. His next attention was to shift the treasury from Murshidabad to Calcutta. Murshidabad was the capital of the Nawab and Warren Hastings shifted this treasury from Murshidabad to Calcutta. So, with the appointment of the collectors, the entire 
revenue collection management began to be vested in the hands of the officials of the company. What relations Warren Hastings had with uh, the Nawab of Bengal? Even though the collection of revenue went into the hands of the servants of the English East India Company, the Nawab still enjoyed sovereignty. Warren Hastings appointed Munni Beham. She was the widow of former Nawab of Bengal, Murjafar, as the guardian of the minor Nawab, Mubarak Uddawla. Since Mubarak Uddawla was a minor, as a regent, Munni Begum was appointed. Another effort made by Warren Hastings was he reduced the allowance, annual allowance granted to the Nawab of Bengal from 32 lakhs to 16 lakhs per annum. These were the major changes introduced by Warren Hastings with regard to the Nawab of Bengal. Settlement with the Shah Alam II, who was Shah Alam II, it was the Mughal Emperor. He was defeated by Robert Clive in 1764 and with whom Robert Clive concluded the Treaty of Allahabad. Under this Treaty of Allahabad, the British agreed to provide a subsidy of 26 lakhs rupees to Shah Alam II. But Warren Hastings stopped it. The practice of giving annual subsidy of 26 lakhs rupees to Shah Alam II, the Mughal ruler, was stopped by Warren Hastings. You may recall the districts of Allahabad and Kore. These districts were taken over from Nawab of Aut, Shujaud Dawla, and handed over to Shah Alam II. But Warren Hastings took away Allahabad and Kore from Shah Alam II and he sold Allahabad and Kore back to the Nawab of Aut, Shujaud Dawla. For 50 lakh rupees. Now, coming to revenue reforms, the revenue reforms which had been developed by Akbar became in ineffective by 18th century. New effective revenue reforms were to be implemented in Bengal. This task was left to Warren Hastings to devise a new revenue settlement and to introduce in Bengal and Bihar, Orissa. Following which in 1772, he devised and introduced a new revenue system which was quinquennial revenue system or a five-year settlement of land revenue. Quinquennial settlement. This five-year settlement came into known as quinquennial settlement because the settlement was made for five years. Under this system, the responsibility of the collection of land revenue directly from the peasants were given to contractors. Those contractors who offered large sums of money were given the contract of collecting land revenue directly from the peasants. These contractors engaged in the collection of revenue from the peasants and paid with the British. Each district was placed under a district collector who has the overall supervision of the collection of land revenue, but he did not directly involve, the collector did not directly involve the collection of land revenue, but he was at the district 
for managing the affairs of the collection of revenue. The direct collection of land revenue from the peasants were made by these contractors. These contractors system or the quinquennial system or this five year settlement was a total failure. How did this five year annual settlement or quinquennial system emerge failure? Many contractors they got their contract for the collection of revenue from the peasants by offering a large amounts of money. But in practice, it was not possible for the contractors. This huge amount of money they promised when they got the contract. Even with the oppressive measures, the land tax was fixed high. Even with oppressive measures, the contractors were not able to collect this huge amount of money as land taxes from these peasants. The peasants were heavily exploited because of the high revenue demand of these contractors. Most of these revenue farmers, the contractors popularly known as revenue farmers, even though they did not actually engage in any kind of farming, they came in known as revenue farmers. Whether they did have any permanent interest on the land, the answer is exactly no, because the each district or a subdivision was handed over to a contractor only for 5 years. These contractors, once they got the contract of the collection of land revenue for 5 years, they used it to extract as much money as possible. So, they did not have any permanent interest on improving the agricultural production. They wanted to have only money from the peasants. Even the, the interesting fact was that even the servants of the English East India Company took participation in the bidding. They also con got contract of collection of land revenue from the peasants. Over and above, the state demand was high. So, it forced the contractors to collect a high amount of tax from the peasants. As you have been told earlier, despite the best efforts to oppressive machines, these contractors, most of the contractors failed to pay the fixed amount they promised to the government while getting the contract. Following which, this British government took trial of the certain revenue farmers. Following the failure of this five year settlement or quinquennial settlement, another settlement was discovered and introduced by Warren Hastings and implemented in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. It came in known as annual settlement. Earlier, the contract of the collection of land revenue was given for 5 years. Now, it was reduced to 1 year. It was given the highest bidder, the right to collection of land revenue was given to the highest bidder in the public auction. During this annual settlement, semindars were given more preference, but in the quinquennial or the five year settlement, semindars were not given preference. But in this annual settlement, the semindars, even though they did not enjoy 
proprietorship or the ownership of the land, the zamindars were given more preference in this annual settlement. The collectors were to supervise the collection of revenue in their district, even though the district collector was not directly involved in the collection of land revenue, whose task was only to supervise the collection of land revenue. Who did collect these taxes? The semintars, the highest bidders to whom the right to collection of land revenue was given and the semintars directly collected taxes from the peasants and paid to the district administration headed by the district collector. This was the annual system of settlement introduced by Warren Hastings in 1776. Even though the district collectors were given the charge of the supervision of collection of land revenue, they could not enjoy the power of settlement in the revenue. This right was vested with the committee of revenue at Calcutta. It resulted the concentration of power in the hands of the committee of revenue. Instead of giving the right of settlement of revenue, this committee of revenue concentrated this power in their hands. Likewise, the five year settlement or the quinquennial settlement the annual settlement also met with the failures. It ended in transcendent failure. Now coming to the judicial reforms introduced by Warren Hastings in Bengal. Before the introduction of the judicial reforms by Warren Hastings, the Semintars who decided the civil and the criminal cases in Bengal. But in 1765, through the Treaty of Allahabad with the Shah Alam II, the British got the Diwani of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa in 1765. You may recall the Treaty of Allahabad. It was ended in between Robert Clive and Shah Alam II. Under this treaty, the British got the Diwani rights of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. With this, the civil jurisdiction, civil jurisdiction passed into the hands of the English East India Company. However, in practice, it was exercised by deputy divan, an Indian officer, not by the British officials. Even though the British got the divani rights in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa, they did not employ British officials for the management of the revenue collection. But the Indian officers were appointed to the manage to manage the affairs of the English East India Company in Bengal. But with the arrival of Warren Hastings, this practice came to an end. Warren Hastings began to employ the servants of the English East India Company in managing the affairs of the British in Bengal. In 1772, Warren Hastings introduced judicial reforms in Bengal. It was not a complete shift from the Mughal pattern of judicial administration. It was more or less modeled upon the Mughal pattern. At a district level, two courts were set up by Warren Hastings. One, Divani Adalat for settling civil disputes. 
ഫൗജ്ദാരി അദാലത്ത് ടു സെറ്റിൽ ഓർ ടു എൻ്റർടൈൻ ക്രിമിനൽ കേസസ് ഇറ്റ് വാസ് ഡിസ്ട്രിക്ട് കളക്ടർ ഹു പ്രൊസൈഡ് ഓവർ ദി ദിവാനി അദാലത്ത് ദിവാനി അദാലത്ത് ഡിസൈഡ് സിവിൽ കേസസ് ഇൻക്ലൂഡിങ് പേഴ്സണൽ പ്രോപ്പർട്ടി ഇൻഹെറിറ്റൻസ് കേസസ് റിലേറ്റിംഗ് ടു മാരീജ് ഡെറ്റ് ആൻഡ് കാസ്റ്റ് ആൾ ദി സിവിൽ കേസസ് വെയർ ഹിയേറ്റ് ആസ് ഫാർ ആസ് ഇൻ ദി കേസ് ഓഫ് സിവിൽ കേസസ് ഫോർ ദി ഹിന്ദൂസ് ഹിന്ദു ലാവാസ് മെയ്ഡ് ആപ്ലിക്കബിൾ ഇൻ സിവിൽ കേസസ് ഇൻ കേസ് ഓഫ് ദി മുസ്ലിംസ് ദി മുസ്ലിം ലാവാസ് ആപ്ലിക്കബിൾ ഫോർ സിവിൽ കേസസ് this civil court or diwani adalat decided cases involving an amount up to 500 rupees but with regard to all civil cases of above 500 rupees appeals lay to the sadar diwani adalat sadar diwani adalat was the appeal court it entertained appeals even civil cases from diwani adalat at a district level diwani adalat was constituted at a district level it was to be, it was to be presided over by the district collector sadar diwani adalat was located at calcutta it entertained appeals from district diwani adalat presided over by the district district collector who did preside over the sadar diwani adalat sadar diwani adalat was it to be presided over by the president or the governor and the two members of the supreme council and they were to be assisted by the indian officers it was the governor or the president who presided over the court of sadar diwani adalat and this court functioned with the support of the indian officers the indian officers who were engaged in interpreting hindu laws or the muslim laws because as far as hindus were concerned hindu laws were made applicable in civil cases as far as muslims were concerned in civil cases muslim or muhammadan law was made applicable the criminal court which was established at a district came to known as district fauchidari adalat who did preside over this criminal court of district fauchidari adalat it entertained criminal cases it was presided over by the indian officers of the company not the british officials but the indian officer presided over the functioning of the district fauzdari adalat as in the case of the moguls qasis and the muftis they were expert in laws Muhammadan laws with this assistance of mufti and qasis this district fauchidari adalat court functioned during the period of the mughals these qasis and muftis discharged judicial functions however indian officer presided over the district fauchidari adalat this court was supervised by district collector his main duty was to ensure that impartial and fair trial had taken place in district fauchidari adalat or not as far as criminal law in criminal cases muhammadan law was made applicable we have seen that in civil cases the hindu law was 
made applicable for the Hindus and for the Muslims, Muhammadan law was made applicable. But in criminal cases, Muhammadan law was followed for all, whether it was Muslim or Hindu, for all these Muhammadan law was made applicable in Fawjidari Adalat. The Fawjidari Adalat could not award death sentence. It was also could not attach the property of the convicts. Appeals from Fawjidari Adalat lay to Sadar Nisamad Adalat. We have seen earlier an appeal court for civil cases. It was Sadar Diwani Adalat and for civil criminal cases Sadar Nisamad Adalat was the court of appeal for civil cases Sadar Diwani Adalat was the court of appeal for the criminal cases Sadar Nisamad Adalat was the appeal court who did preside over this appeal court of Sadar Nisamad Adalat it was deputy Nazim Deputy Nasim presided over the Sadar Nisamad Adalat. Who did preside over the Sadar Diwani Adalat? It was the President. Or the Governor presided over the Sadar Diwani Adalat. As far as Sadar Nisamad Adalat, it was Deputy Nasim. He was assisted by Chief Kwasi and Chief Mufti. In addition to three Maulavis. Because in criminal cases, Muhammadan law was made applicable. Chief Qasi, Chief Mufti, and the Maulavis were experts in Muhammadan law. So they were appointed to help Deputy Nasim in the administration of criminal justice. However, the President and the Council of the Bengal supervised the functioning of the Sadar Nisamad Adalat. It was the court of appeal in criminal cases. Now coming to the establishment of Supreme Court at Calcutta. You may recall that it was for the first time a Supreme Court was established at Calcutta through the Regulating Act of 1773. This highest court exercised jurisdiction over all persons in Calcutta, whether they were Indian or European. As far as the complaints or the suits emerged outside the jurisdiction of Calcutta were heard by this court with the consent of the affected parties. If the affected parties wanted to originate suit or cases in the Supreme Court, they were given the right to it, they were free to approach the court. The interesting fact was that two different types of laws existing existed in Bengal, which law did Supreme Court administer the Supreme Court which was created in Bengal in 1774 through the Regulating Act administered English law. Ilija Imbe was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court established in Calcutta. It administered two different, there existed two different types of laws in Bengal. As far as Supreme Court was concerned, it administered English laws like British pattern with the help of a jury. What Sadar Diwani Adalat administered Hindu laws for Hindus and Muhammadan laws for Muslims. Sadar Nisamad Adalat 
used Muhammadan laws in the administration of criminal justice. But different types of laws existed in Bengal because of the creation of Fauchidari Adalat, Diwani Adalat, and Sadar Diwani Adalat, Sadar Nisamad Adalat, and above all these courts when Supreme Court was created in 1774. In addition to these laws, rules and regulations were also framed by the President and the Supreme Council under their legislative capacity. And there was a need to remove the friction between the Supreme Court, Sadar Diwani Adalat and Sadar Nisamad Adalat. These courts exceeded their jurisdictions and ended into conflict with each other. And in order to develop a harmonious relationship between Supreme Court and Sadar Diwani Adalat and Sadar Nisamad Adalat, in October 1780, Warren Hastings appointed the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Ilija Imbe as the superintendent of Sadar Dibani Adalat. But the appointment of Ilija Imbe as the superintendent of the Sadar Dibani Adalat was disapproved by the Court of Directors. They managed the affairs of the English East India Company in London. Once this Court of Directors disapproved, the appointment of Ilija Imbe as the superintendent of the Sadar Diwani Adalat, he was forced to resign in 1782. In 1782, Ilija Imbe resigned as the superintendent of the Sadar Diwani Adalat. In addition to these judicial reforms, he also used it to codify Hindu and Muslim laws. A translation of this court was published in 1776 under the title of the Court of Jindulas. Now coming into commercial reforms introduced by Warren Hastings. There existed a number of customs houses in Bengal. But once he came into power, he reduced the number of customs houses to five. There were only five customs houses during the period of Warren Hastings. These were located at Calcutta, Hooghly, Mushidabad, Dhaka, and Patna in Bihar. There were five customs houses which were established by Warren Hastings. The duty, the customs duty was also reduced. It was fixed at 2.5 percent. All merchants were required to pay the customs tax, whether it was Indian or the European. As we have seen in any of the previous lectures, these English officials of the East India Company engaged in the misuse of Dastaga or free passes. Actually, this Dastaga and the free passes were given only to the English East India Company for engaging trade in Bengal duty free. But these company officials used this Dastaga or duty free pass for engaging trade without paying customs taxes. Warren Hastings, he checked this misuse of Dastaga or duty pass by English officials for private trade. He also checked the exploitation of the weavers of Bengal by the agents of the English East India Company. The weavers had been forced to sell these cloth items at a low price so that the company agents could maximize their profit 
But Warren Hastings came forward to check these practice, leading to the exploitation of the viewers. He also came forward to develop trade relations with Bhutan and Tibet in order to amass wealth for the English East India Company. But one of the defects of the system introduced by Warren Hastings was that he did not give any place to the sons of the soil. All the higher posters began to be filled with the Indians. Now Warren Hastings becomes Governor General as we have seen in one of the previous lectures through the Regulating Act. It was the first constitutional enactment made by the British Parliament with regard to the affairs of the India. With the passage of this Regulating Act in British Parliament in 1773, a collegiate government was introduced in Bengal. It consisted of Governor General and four members of the Council, in whom vested the executive as well as the legislative powers. All decisions were taken based on the simple majority. The Governor General would enjoy only a casting out in case of a tie. The name of Governor General and the members of the Supreme Council were given in this Regulating Act itself. In the Regulating Act, it was mentioned that Warren Hastings was it to be the Governor General. So, Warren Hastings became the first Governor General of Bengal in 1773 through the Act of through the Regulating Act. Who were the members of the Supreme Council? Philip Francis, Clavering, Monson, and Perwell. They were the members of the Supreme Council. They were required to hold office for a tenure of five years. However, all decisions were to be taken based on simple majority. From 1774 to 1776, Warren Hastings was outvoted in this council because the other three members formed a majority. So, he was not able to execute most of his plans through this council. Now, we are going to see Warren Hastings relations with other Indian rulers. During this time, during the arrival of Warren Hastings, the Marathas had recovered from the pa Battle of Panipat, Third Battle of Panipat in 1761. The Marathas had been recovering under the powerful Peshwa Madhavarau. They were once again establishing their supremacy over North India. They occupied the territories of the Dajabuts and reached Delhi. Likewise, in South India, Hyder Ali was preparing for the defeat of the English with the support of the French. Warren Hastings had to face these difficulties, the challenges from Marathas in Western India as well as from Hyder Ali in Mysore. Relations with Auth, first of all we will be looking at the relations Warren Hastings made with Auth. Robert Clive, he considered Auth as a buffer state. You may recall that Robert Clive ended in a treaty with the Nabab Shuja Daula of Auth 
in 1765. Under this treaty, Korea and Allahabad were handed over by Shujaud Dawla, the Nawab of Fawd, to Shah Alam II, the Mughal ruler. Subsidiary alliance was also introduced on the Nawab of Fawd. The Nawab once this alliance was established, Aut had been demanding military help from the English East India Company without paying extra expenses. So, it was a heavy loss to the English East India Company. So, it was left to Warren Hastings to redefine the relationship between English East India Company and out the buffer state. He concluded a treaty with the Nawab of Out, Shujaud Dawla. It was the Treaty of Benares signed between Nawab Shujaud Dawla and Warren Hastings in 1773. Under the Treaty of Benares, signed between Shujaud Dawla and Warren Hastings, Allahabad and Korea were handed over back to Shujaud Dawla of Out for 50 lakh rupees. Earlier, Robert Clive had ceded Allahabad and Korea from Shujaud Dawla the Nawab of Out to Shah Alam II. But now, Warren Hastings took away Allahabad and Korea from Shah Alam II. Shah Alam II, the Mughal ruler, to whom Robert Clive ceded Allahabad and Korea in 1765 through the Treaty of Allahabad. Now, Warren Hastings took away Allahabad and Korea from Shah Alam II and handed over to the Shujao Dawla, the Nawab of Out. The Nawab also agreed to increase the subsidy for the company's troops whenever he called the service of the troops of the English East India Company. He was required to pay 210,000 rupees instead of earlier 30,000 rupees. Earlier, the Nawab of Out had paid 30,000 rupees for the service of the military help under one brigade was called into service. But now, for one brigade was called into service, Shujao Dawla was required to pay 2 lakh 10,000 rupees a month. In the war between the Nawab of Out and the Rohilas, the company offered military assistance to the Nawab of Out in 1774. Now, another major challenge Warren Hastings period faced was from the Marathas. During this period of Warren Hastings as the Governor General witnessed the first Anglo-Maratha war between the British and the Marathas. In 1772, one of the most powerful Peshwa of the Marathas, Madhava Rao, he died. He had played a key role in recovering the Marathas from the Panipat debacle. Narayan Rao became the next Peshwa after the death of Madhava Rao. But Narayan Rao did not rule long. He was killed in 1773. After the death of Narayana Rao, two persons came forward demanding Peshwaship. The son of let Narayana Rao, Madhav Rao Narayan. 
another person was rekhunath rao but two persons madhava rao narayan and rekhunath rao he was the uncle of narayan rao came forward climbing peshwa ship after the death of narayan rao rekhunath rao was incapable to fight against the council of regency headed by nana fatnavis the chief minister of pune so rekhunath rao turned his attention towards the british for help to become the next peshwa so rekhunath rao and the british in bombay signed a treaty treaty of surat in 1775 in rekhunath rao the british government saw a blind tool to establish british supremacy at pune soon after the treaty of surat signed between the british and rekhunath rao british forces occupied the two important harbors or ports of western india salt city and basain and the british began to fight against the maratha forces at pune but warren hastings came in to know about the fight between the marathas and the british government in bombay only after the actual military operations were started the supreme government headed by warren hastings questioned the wisdom of the bombay government for fighting for raghunath rao against the marathas so warren hastings sent colonel upton to bombay in order to establish a settlement with the marathas colonel upton reached bombay and he concluded treaty of purandar in 1776 with the marathas at pune under this treaty the british got two important ports in western india salt city and basain the british also accepted a war indemnity from the marathas and they gave up once for all the case of the raghunath rao and recognized the madhav rao narayan as the peshwa of the marathas at pune it was during the period of warren hastings the second round of struggle between hyder ali and the english took place during the period spanning between 1780 1784 during the first round of struggle between hyder ali and the british they signed a treaty at the end of the first anglo mysore war in 1769 that is the treaty of madras the period of the first round of anglo mysore war was from 1767 to 1769 in 1769 by the treaty of madras the first anglo mysore war came to an end under the terms of the treaty of madras signed between hyder ali and the british both the powers agreed to help with each other in case of a military attack by the third party but the british failed to stick the promise made in the treaty when the marathas invaded mysore the british did not come forward to militarily help hyder ali as per the terms of the treaty but the british kept allow 
But the outbreak of the American War of Independence in 1775 and the French alliance with the American colonists in 78 made Warren Hastings suspicious of Hyder Ali's alliance with the French. In Europe, now the French and the English was on the opposite side, they ranged on opposite side on the question of American War of Independence. The American colonies was fighting against the British. The Americans got support from the French. In this background, the second round of conflict between the British and the Mysorean ruler Hyder Ali broke out. On the part of the Hyder Ali, he arranged a joint front with the support of the Naisam of Hyderabad and the Marathas against their common enemy. Was the common enemy? It was English East India Company. With the support of the Naisam of Hyderabad and the Marathas, Hyder Ali attacked. Karnatik. Karnatik had been under the influence of the French since the death of Chanda Sahib, from whom the Karnatik had been occupied by the British. In this Hyder Ali's attack, he was able to capture the capital of the Karnatik Arcot defeating the English army under Colonel Bailey. However, the immediate background for the second round of struggle between the Mysorean ruler Hyder Ali and the English was provided by the attempt of the British to capture a French settlement at Mahi. Before that, the British brought to their side, the Nizam of Hyderabad and the Marathas. With the support of the Nizam of Hyderabad and the Marathas, the English defeated Hyder Ali at Porto Novo in 1781. The English force was led by Sir General Ayrcute during this time against Hyder Ali. But in the next year, in 1782, Hyder Ali inflicted a defeat on the English forces led by Colonel Braithwaite. But during the course of the Second Anglo-Mysore War, Hyder Ali died and he was succeeded by his son. Tipu Sultan as the next ruler of Mysore. He continued the war against the British. But both the Tipu Sultan and the English did not want to continue the war. Tipu Sultan wanted to strengthen his internal administration immediately after came into power. On the other hand, the English began to face financial crunch. So, both of them decided to discontinue the war. By the Treaty of Mangalore, signed between Tipu Sultan and the British, the second Anglo-Mysore war came to an end in 1784. The extent of the territories under English East India Company during the period of Warren Hastings. During the period of Warren Hastings, the English territories consisted of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa, they got in 1765. Benares and Gesipur were acquired by Warren Hastings from the Nawab of Aud through the Treaty of Faisabad in 1775. Under this treaty, Warren Hastings got Benares and Gesipur. Northern Sarkats they got during the course of the Second Carnatic War. Salsetti, 
the accord from the English East India Company accord from the Marathas through the Treaty of Purandar in 1776. Then they had already been well established in Madras and Bombay harbors. In addition to this, this military revenue and administrative reforms, Warren Hastings also paid attention to the Oriental learning. It was during the period of Warren Hastings in 1784, the Asiatic Society of Bengal was started for studying the culture, history and languages of India. And it was Warren Hastings who started Calcutta Madrasa in 1781. Now coming into the major questions on this topic, make an assessment of the policies of Warren Hastings. Why did Warren Hastings revenue reforms fail? His five year as well as annual settlements were failure. Hastings relations with the Indian rulers and lastly explain the importance of the regulating act. Thank you students for watching this class. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude immoral, vulgar and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvellous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets. <laughs>